for everyone. I, I was looking at the chat quickly and I saw some people in Alaska, which is most likely mo most more, much more colder than it is in Montreal right now. So that's interesting. Um, we're, we're all coming in to, to today to talk about uh, accessibility heuristics. So um, this is a follow-up to the webinar that we did uh, about a month and a half ago that Caitlin Geyer and I did about a month and a half ago. Uh, Caitlin was supposed to be with us today, but she could not make it. So um, I am here uh, for, for to, to cover for, for us on her behalf. And uh, the, the topic today is looking into a framework that will allow us to evaluate design comps, design uh, wireframes, prototypes, and whatnot for accessibility. So in other words, making accessibility more accessible to designers, which is a pretty big uh, challenge, I would say, um, throughout my career. I would say that uh, the people that have always been more uh, resistant to accessibility have often been designers just because they're so afraid of the constraints that uh, accessibility puts on their work. Um, so we've been thinking about ways to make accessibility easier for, uh, for designers for a long time. And, and over the past year, Caitlin and I have sort of put our thoughts together and we came up with this uh, idea that we're going to share, well, that I'm going to share with you today um, about heuristics. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so, so I'm I'm the one at the bottom, the less the, the well, I guess the more hairy one of the two. Um, so my name is Denis. Uh, I'm principal consultant and training lead at DQ Systems, and uh, I'll be your host today with along with uh, Laura. So let's start with heuristics. So um, some of you may be wondering what heuristics are to begin with. Um, this is, a, this is a term that is, is very common in design, uh, maybe not so common if you come from a developer or a QA background or a content background in general. Uh, the, uh, the easiest way to explain what a heuristic would be, a very simple way to explain that, is a general rule of thumb about something. So the, um, the heuristics per se come from, uh, come from UX, come from usability, come from research and psychology to begin with. And the idea is to, uh, and, they, and they basically come Initially, from uh, from uh, Jacob Nielsen, uh, in the early 90s, he was working with a colleague of his on finding ways to evaluate the usability of uh, software products. And they came up with this idea of building heuristics for usability that would allow them to define how, how usable a product was back then. So those, uh, those uh, heuristics were basically developed in 1995, so it's been a long time already. And, uh, and, and when they came up, when, when Nielsen came up with these heuristics, um, you had 10 of them. Um, and for those of you who can see the screen here, you have a couple of examples on the right-hand side of, of what those were. So I'm just gonna name a few just for, uh, for the sake of everyone. So ideas like visibility of the system status, uh, and the idea behind that would be that the system should always keep users informed about what is going on uh, through appropriate feedback within reasonable time, or maybe things like consistency and standards where users should not have to wonder whether different words, situations, or actions mean the same thing, uh, and you have to follow platform conventions. So this gives you an idea, hopefully, that what, what he was using were these eye-level general rules of thumb to sort of guide design decisions for, uh, for, for improved usability. And, and this concept has been exi existing like for 23 years now um, with, with, I would say, a lot of success uh, in the usability uh, field. And, and whether or not you, you think that Nielsen is someone who's very important today, he definitely was someone who was very important in 1995 and, and in early 2000s where he made a lot of impact on the, the, the field of, of usability and eventually so because those heuristics have lasted for so long, at some point it made sense to us to think about how we could apply these things to accessibility and see what, what can come out of that. So um, the idea of those heuristics, uh, when, when you develop those things, they came with uh, the, the, a process, which was basically the process for an evaluation or heuristic evaluation. And basically what that was, was this idea that you first had to define a scope uh, of what you wanted to assess, and then you would find a few people that would be able to do an evaluation, and, and th three to five being like the sweet spot, uh, but with, with keeping in mind the idea that you could have only one person doing it or more, but having a certain number of people 
run through the process together, following the same rules to try and find uh, commonalities. And then you would define uh, a ranking scale. Like for instance, zero might mean that you have no problems. And then on a scale of the zero to three, maybe three is a catastrophic usability failure, for instance. And then it gives you an idea of, of what your findings, whether or not they have a huge impact on the usability of a product. And then you would evaluate uh, the site, the system against each of those heuristics. Uh, and then you mark down what the issues are and, and when, when they occur, how they can be fixed and so on and so forth. Um, if you have multiple evaluators, then you might go into a debrief and you prioritize the findings uh, by, by, by consensus, like reaching consensus on, on those findings. And then you eventually create a, a report of those findings uh, per se. And for those of you who are uh, doing ev evaluations in accessibility, this process probably looks very similar, very familiar to what you're already doing. So when we were looking at this idea of heuristic evaluation, we were surprised that the concept itself is not, um, is not implemented much more officially throughout our, our, own, uh, our own processes in accessibility. Like we do accessibility evaluations, of course, um, but we don't necessarily apply the same logic as we did in, as people do in heuristic evaluations. So we thought we could look into that and try to uh, come up with a process that would look like uh, the heuristic evaluation process that designers are familiar with therefore hoping that designers would much, be much more likely to adopt this as something that actually makes sense to them, as opposed to trying to force down success criteria or guidelines or WCAG down their throats. Um, so, and the reason why the, these evaluation, uh, these heuristic evaluations work is because for one thing, they're very simple to do. Anyone can get up to speed doing such an evaluation in a very short amount of time. Uh, by nature, they are subjective. Uh, but then again, so is usability in, in general, and to a certain extent, so extent so is accessibility as well. Um, they're, they're easy to learn, um, and, and basically, they don't create a lot. A lot of uh, they have a pretty low overhead in general. You don't have to plan for much in advance in order to be able to do it, and they create these new viewpoints on uh, on on. on interface, uh, user interface uh, elements, for instance, or, or particular interactions that you may be looking into and, and help you discover new perspectives on those things based on what kind of user you're, you're, you're thinking about or, or what kind of users you're involving in that process to begin with. So at DQ, uh, over the past year, we uh, underwent a redesign of our, of our brand, of our site. And uh, of course, doing what we do, we had to make sure that everything would be as accessible as we could possibly make it. So from the very beginning of the process, when we were working with the agency that, uh, that developed the site for us, we wanted to make sure that accessibility would be factored in from the very beginning. So what we have on the screen right now is an example of one of the wireframes that were initially created um, to demonstrate what the homepage could look like. And, and like historically, when we work with designers or when we work with clients uh, very early on in their process of, of a redesign, we often work at this level here where people will show us their wireframes, show us their mockups, and we, we give them uh, guidelines, recommendations, pointers uh, for potential issues for accessibility. And, and the reason why that is is because we want to avoid developers eventually building something. We want to make sure that they start on the right foot, basically. And, uh, and there's a lot of information you can provide at the wireframe level to sort of guide how the developers are going to structure their content. So the earlier in the process we, uh, we get involved with accessibility, the more likely we're going to guide the client towards the, the expected goal, which is having a, an accessible website or an accessible platform or an accessible product uh, without having to spend a lot of time fixing issues that nobody saw coming. So we did the same thing, uh, basically eating our own dog food in this case. And, and, and the agency that we work with has, has some, ex some accessibility experience, but it wasn't an accessibility, uh, it did not have accessibility as their specialty. So, uh, so there, were, there were a few things that we had to, ex to, to discuss with them and, and sort of adjust. And, and the question really was, how do we successfully address accessibility at that level so their developers will know exactly what they're going to be working on? So it was a perfect situation, perfect scenario for us to try those heuristics uh, and, and then see how that would work with the designers. And this is basically what, we're, what I'm going to show you today. 
how we went through that process and how we applied those heuristics in our, our own process for, for the redesign of the site. So those accessibility heuristics per se. Um, same idea, so we're talking about general rules of thumb, in this case about accessibility, about accessibility evaluation specifically in the context of design, in the context of wireframes, mockups, prototypes, everything that comes before the actual coding phase. So, uh, and the idea, like I said, for the, the purpose is for evaluating designs for accessibility. Got a little ahead of myself right there. Um, this is mostly aimed for designers uh, as a starting point, though I would argue that understanding those heuristics is beneficial for anyone involved in the overall uh, development lifecycle process of an accessible product. Because if you do understand that mindset, the mindset that comes with those heuristics, then you're much more likely to understand what the intent is behind all of the, the different guidelines, different success criteria, and, and better understand where those things are or what those things are supposed to mean. Um, but the idea is to evaluate those wireframes, mockups, and prototypes, like I said. Uh, we look for issues in information architecture, in interactions, navigation, and visual design in general. And none of what I'm going to talk about covers actual code because at this point there usually isn't any source code yet. We're, we're working basically uh, with visual uh, elements. And, and the reason why we feel that it's important is because accessibility and WCAG specifically is much more harder than we like to admit. Um, most of us who have been in this field for a while have at some point or another pretended that accessibility is something that's rather easy that it's not rocket science, that you just have to dive into it and then you'll figure it out. But the reality is, it's much more complicated than we'd like to admit. And not because the implementation itself is complicated, because if you take any of those elements at a very granular level, most of them are, are pretty simple. But when you look at the overall uh, quantity of, of, of elements to cover, it makes it very overwhelming and very daunting very quickly for anyone who doesn't get up one morning thinking, as of today, I'm passionate about this and I'm really going to give a damn about, the, about accessibility. For anyone who doesn't feel that way, this is a lot of information and this is too much and it just adds up on, on top of what they're already doing and very quickly it becomes something that's much more difficult. So WCAG is notoriously, notoriously difficult to interpret. Um, any, uh, any of you who have ever looked at a discussion on the web aim list, for instance, will know what I'm talking about. You can have people that argue or interpret things differently and then just argue for days and days on end uh, about what a particular success criteria might mean. And again, if you're someone who doesn't, who is not an expert and you're looking for guidance and then the experts don't even agree amongst themselves, how can you feel good about what you're supposed to do with this? So very quickly, again, it makes everything much more harder. And, uh, and a lot of this stuff in WCAG really doesn't apply to designers anyway. It's all, it's related to the source code, it's related to how a screen reader interprets something, and all of that stuff, while interesting, is not relevant to a designer. So we needed to have something that was much more focused and would help designers be much more successful in their, in their own undertaking of accessibility. So this is what we introduced. So this idea of accessibility heuristics, um, you can download that document right now if you want to. So the link is a, a bit.ly link. So http colon slash slash bit dot ly forward slash a 11 y hyphen heuristics. So h e u r i s t i c s. Um, I'll I'll, sh I'll I'll share the link again a little later on uh, if you want to grab it at that moment. But basically. The presentation is going to be about those 10 general rules of thumb that we came up with that basically revisit WCAG in a much more realistic fashion uh, with a focus on designers specifically to help them, to help guide them towards building mockups, wireframes, or prototypes that are aligned with accessibility expectations from the very beginning. So as I said, we were working on the redesign of our own site. So you may or may not have seen the actual uh, end result that was launched prior to CSUN, so two or three weeks ago. Uh, but that's basically what the, the, the head of our homepage looks like now. Um, and this is what we're going to be looking into in terms of, uh, of our process, going through these heuristics and, and going through the process of designing from those initial wireframes to the, the, the final outcome which was launched like two or three weeks ago. 
So that first heuristic is uh, labeled na navigation and wayfinding. So the idea behind this one is that users can easily navigate, find content, and determine where they are at all times within the system. So we're purposely saying system because it could be a website, it could be a web application, it could be a native mobile app, it could be a bunch of different things. And as we move further and further from web content to thinking about accessibility in general of content, then the idea of a system seems much more um, relevant to us than talking about a website, for instance, or a web page. So in terms of how we can interpret what navigation and wayfinding might mean, uh, we came up with a couple, uh, a couple of, uh, of starting points, like elements that would be part of this general idea, just to help the designers sort of wrap their head around what, what they need to think about when they think about navigation and wayfinding. So examples of what that could be would be uh, means being provided to jump straight to the main content. So some of you may, may, uh, may, may relate that to a particular success criterion, in this case, 2.4.1 for uh, bypassing links, or uh, bypassing content, I mean, or, or links remain meaningful even when taken out of context, which again, relates to what gag would be related to 2.4.4 in this case, or interactive elements have clear and visible focus states, which is another one that we, could easily identify as something relevant for wayfinding and navigation, and in this case would relate to 2.4.7, so this idea of visible focus. And then organization of navigational elements facilitate wayfinding. So again here, this idea of how we can organize content in a way where it's easier to identify where we are. Um, and, and, and all of those things relate one way or another to success criteria, but, uh, but we don't feel the need to talk about success criteria when we talk to designers. What we feel the, the need is for is really get them to understand why this is valuable, why this is relevant for the users ultimately. So looking at, at these, different, uh, these different checkpoints uh, related to the, the, the heuristic, we decided to focus on, on one a particular one that we, that we spent time on, which was this idea of interactive elements have clear and visible focus states. So I'm assuming a lot of you are aware that on most websites, if you navigate without a mouse, chances are you will not be able to clearly see where your focus is as you're tabbing through the interface. This is something that's very obvious to someone who works in, in, in the field of accessibility, but maybe not so obvious for the design agency that works on creating your new brand or your new, uh, your, your new visual representation. So we worked with our agency to do that, providing them some guidance like this. You can see on the screen here, we have uh, different versions of our, our top navigation. Uh, and what we did is we annotated, annotated uh, different parts of it to give them uh, guidelines as to what we were expecting. So for instance, for that top navigation, when we have an element that is currently selected, it has this, uh, this dark blue um, underline. And then what we had in terms of, of, uh, of notes or annotation related to that would be that um, the folk, uh, the, on focus, you would have a, a um, in CSS, you would have a, a, a border at the bottom uh, that would be five pixels uh, uh, high, would have a particular Xcode value. And then on hover, you would show the submenu. That leads us to the second annotation in there. And then again, where we provide more information about what we expect. Like for instance, that the, you invert the color of the text in the background when you mouse over something or when the focus gets to that, that particular element. Uh, so, so keyboard focus is not forgotten when, uh, when you build or when you design the interaction going through the menu. And then uh, same thing for, uh, for the third example that we have here, the third annotation says, by default, the, uh, the button to get accessibility help is a white button with, uh, with dark navy text. But when you mouse over it, we're going to change the border to the background color to, we're going to change that to the default blue that's behind it. We're going to have just a, a red um, or outline around the button, and then the text will move from dark blue to, to white. So managing these different aspects allows us to really plan and, 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 and make sure that designers think about these elements from the very beginning, and therefore that their, their development team will also know what to do because they will have the proper guidance to do that. But that's an example of, of using one of those, those heuristics there. The second one is about structure and semantics of pages. So the idea behind this one is that users can uh, make sense of the structure of the content on each page and understand how to operate within the system. So in this case, some of the starting points that we have are our uh, are, uh, hierarchical headings are used to organize content. Navigation menus are structured using lists. 
form controls are assigned meaningful text labels, and tabular data is structured using the tables with the header cells. So again, going back to uh, some, some aspect of the wireframes that we worked with initially, we looked at, uh, at uh, hierarchical headings, for instance. So we made sure that the different um, wireframes would have clear uh, indications of the heading levels of each of the headings in those, those, uh, those wireframes. So the developers, again, would know what to, what to look for and what, what was expected of them. So we would define which part of the, the content would be the H1, which, which elements would be the H2s, H3s, and so on and so forth. So again, we could sort of plan the structure, the outline of those pages from the very beginning, as opposed to rely on the developer to do that some, at some point in the process of the, of the development. The third one is about color contrast and legibility. So uh, text and other meaningful information can be easily distinguished and read by users of the system. So some of the examples that we have here are text has sufficient contrast against this background. So again, you will, just, you will recognize that from coming from a, a very popular rule in WCAG. Uh, meaningful graphic elements have sufficient uh, contrast. Link text has sufficient contrast against the surrounding text. And then color is not used as the only way to convey information. So those, are, again, are all things that we would find in WCAG, but we don't feel the need to talk about WCAG to designers. What we think is important is just to tell them these are things that actually make a difference in the uh, user experience of those who will be using that, that system or that product, ultimately. So color contrast here is the example that I decided to, to illustrate. Um, so when we started applying colors to our wireframe. So when we, when we got to that mock-up phase, um, we made sure that the colors that were chosen would have really strong contrast against their background uh, in any given scenario, because there's no reason why we would miss a color contrast uh, issue um, when we're building with this mindset uh, from the very beginning. So whether we're looking into, uh, into really dark navy against white text with a a, a contrast ratio of 16.41 to, to 1, or different other combinations of color, uh, we made sure that we would always be beyond this idea of a, the 4.5 to 1 uh, threshold, thinking it might be 4.5 to 1 for WCAG 2 uh, in, in um, level AA in, in uh, 1.4.3, but why, why stop there? Why, why, just, why settle for 4.5 to 1 when, we, when we have full control over the colors? Let's push that much further, knowing that 4.5 to 1 might be what is required to begin with, but 4.5 to 1 oftentimes is not enough when you have sun glare on your screen when you're outside. So let's push that a little further and try to get something that looks nice, but at the same time pushes the contrast as far as we're, we're willing to go. And in our case, it meant sometimes going to 10, 13, or 16 to 1 uh, to ensure those color contrasts. Language and readability is our fourth one. So in this case, we're talking about content on the page can uh, easily be read and understood by users of the system. Um, so examples of that, again, is the idea of using plain language principles, or applying plain language principles uh, to the content, uh, that labels and headings are being worded to be as meaningful as possible that text passages in different languages, when, whenever there are some, are identified as such. And then sufficient padding and letting uh, makes text easier to read. So again, looking at some of so these are some of the, uh, some of the starting points to think about language and readability as a heuristic. So the one I decided to uh, illustrate on this one was the idea of sufficient padding and letting, uh, making text easier to read. So it's very easy, again, from the perspective of someone who has uh, difficulty with reading and writing or dyslexia or, or any other type of, of, of disability or challenge that makes reading content on the web difficult, getting content that is too, um, that doesn't have enough white space makes everything much more daunting to read and sometimes makes it diffi very difficult to read. So defining a very clear uh, breakdown of how the information is provided helps the users ultimately make better sense of our content. So defining directly at the level of the wireframes or the mockups in this case, that we're going to have very specific uh, distances between different parts of, of, the, of our user interface. So defining 25 pixels between the, uh, the icon there and the heading, and then another 12.5 pixels between the heading and the text itself, and then another 30 pixels between the text and the read more button that's there. And defining that as a, as a standard that we follow through, through the entire interface does two things. It, it does make the content easier to read to begin with, but it also creates consistency 
and predictability in how we're going to understand how the interface works or how it's intended to be used uh, for everyone who looks at this. So it's very visual, obviously. So if someone is blind, they can benefit from that particular element. We would refer or rely on, on more structural, um, well, more, more structured for them to be able to understand that through a assistive technology like a screen reader or a refreshable braille display. But still this idea of defining things in a way that makes it easier is what we're following here in terms of goal with that heuristic. The fifth one is about error prevention and error states. So interactive controls like form elements, widgets, and so on and so forth have persistent, meaningful instructions to help prevent mistakes and provide users with clear error states, which indicate what the problems are and how to fix those problems whenever, either, whenever errors are returned. So again, overview of some of the WCAG uh, fundamentals that we, that we have. Uh, mandatory form controls are clearly identified as being required. Instructions are provided to help prevent errors. Form inputs have persistent and meaningful labels. Inline error messages provide suggestions to fix errors whenever those errors are returned. And in this case, to illustrate that point, we looked into one of the forms that we had in our uh, contact pages and very, very simply made sure that we would identify that uh, to, to the agency that we needed those labels to be, um, to be well, to be real labels for one thing, not to be placeholder labels, uh, to be sitting right on top of the, the form control. So whenever we're shifting from a desktop view to say a mobile view, they would still neatly stack on top of one another with the labels being right above the field that it corresponds to and making everything easier to, uh, to understand in that, in that sense. And then also, because it's a text label then, creating a very simple way and very reliable way to associate the labels with the form controls by using a label, a label element with matching values for the for and the ID attributes of the, uh, the label and the, the input itself. So creating this structure there me it means that it, it will be that much more reliable to begin with, but also looking at the labels themselves and making sure that they're very meaningful, that they're not ambiguous in any way, and then that they will always stay there. They won't disappear when someone starts inputting information into any of the fields like they would with, uh, with placeholder labels, for instance. Because placeholder labels is something that the designers could easily lean towards if they don't even if they don't think about the, the idea that the labels are no longer persistent when uh, when something is added to the, the form control. The second one, the sixth one, is about predictability and consistency. So the purpose of each element is predictable, and how each element relates to the system as a whole is clear and meaningful to avoid confusion to for the users. Some of the starting points that we have, uh, repeated navigation patterns are consistently presented. Recurrent uh, functionalities are consistently identified. Changes of context are not ex unexpectedly triggered. And changes are clearly announced before they take place. So here, we're looking into uh, the repeated navigation patterns and how consistently they are presented across all pages. So we looked at part of our footer, for instance. And at this point, we were looking into the actual implementation of the prototypes, um, so making sure that on every single page, that information that's part of the footer would always be repeated in the exact same way, so it's very predictable, and, and it becomes a, an efficient way for someone to identify where they are, identify where the main content is, and which part of the interface that gets repeated every, on every page corresponds to those, uh, those landmarks that define what what is the, 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 the templated content as opposed to the actual content of that specific page. So defining, for instance, a learn about accessibility, get accessibility tools, get accessibility help has three different sections. And then in each of those sections, having something that's always presented in the same way to create this feeling of consistency. And, uh, and to a certain degree, I would say authority about a particular topic because you're, you're really owning that topic to begin with and you're presenting it in a very consistent way again. The seventh one is about alternatives for visual and auditory content. So purely visual or auditory content that conveys information as text-based alternatives for users who can't see or hear is what this one is about. Um, we have five instead of four here because quite frankly, we just could not rely on, on giving only four in this case. So meaningful alt text is provided for informative images. Purely decorative images are provided with empty alt text or an equivalent. But at the level of the designer, that doesn't really matter. What we need them to understand is that purely decorative images don't need to have 
a text description. Uh, synchronized captions are provided for video content. Text transcripts are provided for audio and video content. And then text-based content is used instead of images of text um, in most situations. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but we want to push towards an actual implementation in HTML and CSS or SVG as opposed to uh, accessible SVG, uh, obviously, as opposed to just an image of text in this case. Um, so the example that we, uh, we decided to illustrate in this case was the idea of meaningful alt text being provided for informative images. So uh, as part of our blog section, we have these headers that are, uh, that are consistently pre presented. So this one is an example of, uh, of a blog post prior to CSUN um, announcing the, the DQ party, the karaoke party, and the X hackathon. So we have a couple of images in there. The first one is a round image that is defining the author of the blog post. In this case, what we have there is just a, a logo of, uh, like a, the, the, the D of the DQ logo, representing the admin or the, 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 the common voice of DQ in, in the blog. And then we have four other icons at the bottom that are social media icons for Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Google+. So looking at those different images, some of them are, definitely informative, active even. You can click on the four links at the bottom, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Google+. So those definitely need to have some alt text, but the one above that, the one representing the author of the blog post, is really more of a decorative element in this case, because right above it, we already have in text uh, a piece of information that says by the queue, which is basically the author of this blog post. So that one could definitely be considered as decorative if we wanted to, and we would not miss any information. So this is, again, an example of what we provided through the mockups to define to the, uh, to the developers, ultimately. So decorative images, we don't need to provide alt text to that. And at that point, we can have a discussion later whether we're going to use a role equals presentation or an empty alt or another technique to, to make the content invisible to a screen reader user, but ultimately we want to define this as something being decorative, as opposed to the other ones where we were we would actually define what the alt text is at this level. So nobody has to wonder what alt text we're providing when we're ready to implement that into an actual uh, into the actual source code. So again, we're saving time by defining these things from the very beginning as opposed to having to ask those questions later on. The eighth one is about uh, accounting for multiple interaction methods. So users can efficiently interact with the system using the input method of their choosing. In other words, mouse, keyboard, touch, or et cetera, whatever other method comes to mind or may eventually come to mind. Um, so this idea is to account for multiple uh, methods that way. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So interactions are not designed to be mouse specific, probably the most important one. Functionalities are built to be keyboard compatible. Equivalent, equivalent touch input methods are accounted for, and call to actions are labeled for voice recognition navigation. So again, four principles that apply to this idea of accounting for multiple interaction methods. And the example that we have here, again, is part of our wireframes where we were defining interactions for um, a particular um, part of our, uh, the life cycle. So when you use a particular tool in your life cycle, for instance. So what we have on the screen is this idea that some of those, some of those, those phases are development, testing, and then in production, you have, again, other, uh, other phases to follow to, uh, to either track your accessibility uh, health or to, to find ways to, to, to stay on top of potential accessibility problems. So we could, if the designer only had designed this to begin with, chances are the learn more that you see on the screen, like those links learn more, that are, that are assigned to each of the different phases would be the only thing that is clickable. But from the very beginning of the process, we can determine that in order to make the entire uh, interface easier to use, and, and especially on touch devices, for instance, or maybe for someone who uses a mouse but has difficulty controlling the mouse due to tremors or due to um, any kind of injury that they may have, to have a much bigger uh, target area to click or to trigger. So uh, instead of having instead of having just to learn more being the link, we just, we've defined at that level at that level already that the entire area will become one big clickable area that will make it easier for other people to, to trigger or to activate. 
So again, something that could easily have been missed uh, at the design level and ultimately having ended up being just a regular link uh, as part of the entire content. Now, because we planned it from the very beginning, we can see uh, how much more usable or, or accessible it can become for someone who struggles with, uh, with fine motor skills or, or, or clicking on smaller, smaller links, for instance, or smaller targets. The ninth one is about providing enough time and preserving information. So users are given enough time to complete tasks and do not lose information if their time, for instance, their session runs out. So in this case, we looked into uh, ways to extend or turn off time limits, uh, make sure that they're provided. Uh, upcoming session timeouts are clearly identified to the users. The data rec recovery after reauthentication is accounted for and then options to postpone or suppress interruptions are offered also. So those are all, again, examples. There could be more, again, uh, but as a starting point, we feel that if you look into these four things, you have a pretty good idea of why it matters to provide enough information, enough time, I mean, for, for users, and then to make sure that if, for any reason, their session times out, that they're not going to lose all the information, but it's still going to be uh, provided back to them when they, when they log back in. So in the context of the redesign for the DQ.com site, we didn't have anything where there's an actual time limit. So we turned to one of our products, World Space Assure, uh, where we definitely have a, uh, a session timeout. Uh, so as people are using the tool to assess their, their web pages, their, their systems, their products or whatnot, um, after some time of inactivity, there is a pop-up that comes up that tells them, so in two minutes, we're going to log you out do you want to continue or basically, or is it okay? And if nobody takes any action, the session times out as it normally would, but if someone acts upon the, the model and clicks that link, then we refre we, we, we renew that, 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 that timer so they can still keep going. And then uh, as long as they're active, then they're not going to be bothered with it again. Um, so again, pretty much like the first example that I showed you, um, we have annotations in here that basically say, so uh, we have a modal, for instance, so the modal can't be exited without taking action. So you trap the focus inside that modal is basically what that means. Uh, and then indication about the, the, the timeout itself, uh, the timer. Uh, so the countdown starts at two minutes before expiration and then just keeps going down from there until it reaches zero. And then the continue working button extends the session by 30 minutes in this case. So it, these are all, again, indications that we can provide at this level that will make the, the developer's job easier because things are defined already. And a lot of those things, the, the, the questions in accessibility are actually defined at the design level. The decisions are being made at that level, but oftentimes they're not, accessibility is not defined at that level. And by defining it at the same time as the decisions are being made, it makes everything much more, again, much more reliable, much more efficient, and much more streamlined and there's much less chances of, of having running into issues or surprises as a result of that. <clears throat> Sorry. And then finally, the last one is control of movement and flashing. So elements on the page that move, flash, or animate in other ways can be stopped and do not distract or harm the user. So for those of you who know WCAG again, we're talking specifically about 2.3.1. Um, it is so important to be, uh, pay attention to something like this that we felt that it needed to be a heuristic of its own because it's one of the few things in accessibility where you will not only annoy someone, you may actually hurt them. So, uh, so it, it's very important that we all are aware of this. So we felt like it needed, it deserved its place as a, uh, as a heuristic to begin with. So examples of what to think about when it comes to movement and flashing is that content does not flash more than three times per second. So again, those of you who know about WCAG recognize this. Content that moves can be stopped on demand. Video and audio files are not set on autoplay. And then the rate at which content is auto-updated can be controlled as well. Because I may not need to have that auto-update every five or 10 seconds. Maybe I want to control that so I can have a better experience going through the content with my own method of navigating through content. So <clears throat> an example of what we have here is about uh, this idea of autoplay, because obviously we didn't have anything on our site that flashed uh, at a point where it could create seizures for people, but we do have a lot of videos uh, on the site, and, and there's always this question about should I just get the videos to start automatically when the page loads, or do I let the user control when they're going to want to begin that video, and we lean towards the, the, the latter. So uh, making sure then that 
the uh, the uh, embedded videos just don't autoplay and we allow the user to start those videos when they're ready. So they don't overlap with maybe their screen readers or they don't start while they're paying attention to something else on the page, but really they start when they're ready to, uh, to consume that content. And again, this is something that could easily have been missed by designers if uh, all we had told them was that, oh yeah, we have videos, so embed videos and pages. They could easily have decided that those videos would autoplay and the designers would have, the developers would have implemented that. Then at some point we would have to go back and tell them to change this. So that's all wasted time and effort if these things are not defined from the very beginning. <clears throat> so those, those 10 heuristics basically are what we're talking about. So, uh, so again, the URL to get there is provided uh, on the screen. So bit.ly slash a11y dash heuristics. Um, it is a PDF document. I will quickly show it to you. Um, it looks like this. So uh, you have these 10 heuristics. They all have their little icon next to them to sort of recognize them. It's a six page document. So if you go through any of the pages afterwards, you get some information I just showed you in the presentation. But as part of a downloadable document, that is obviously uh, accessible also. But uh, that allows you to maybe print out those general rules of thumb as, as reminders, or maybe a, an easier way to share those ideas with your colleagues if you feel that these ideas have value. So, uh, so that, that's basically what this is. The link is, uh, is already available, like I said. So if you're, if you're interested, you can download that and, uh, and have fun with it. And, and I feel that this idea, like the magic behind this, these heuristics, not so much happens when you look into, well, I mean, it does happen when you look into it from the perspective of a designer that applies it to their work, but it also starts creating a lot of, of really interesting uh, value when you, when you involve users with different needs in, uh, or you at least involve personas that have different needs in your, in your process of designing. So the first, the first webinar that we, thought that we presented was about those personas and how you can use inclusive personas or modular personas uh, that, that allow you to have fewer personas, but then you can, you can add different particularities to them to sort of account for different types of expectations or needs. So when you start looking into your, your creation from the lens of those personas, applying these heuristics, you're starting to see a lot of different perspectives on things before you get to a point where you can actually involve real users in the process. So you can, you can already sort of plan and, and, and prevent uh, obvious issues or from, from, from being part of your process uh, without, without realizing it. So, so this, this is basically what, what, we, what we wanted to, to share with you today. So if you, if you already do heuristics evaluations, um, it's probably very easy for you to add heuristics like these to your, your current list. Um, if you work with someone who, who sort of pushes back on, the, on accessibility from a design perspective, maybe these heuristics can help them or help you convince them that accessibility matters and that it's not as, as complicated as it, as it looks. It can be much simpler than having to go through 61 success criteria over three levels of conformance, over 12 guidelines, over four principles, that's a lot of stuff. Um, talking about, thinking about 10 different general concepts is, I feel, a much easier way to wrap your head around what it is, uh, at least as a starting point. Ultimately, I mean, people can, can dive in and try to look at that much more, but it's easier to approach, I feel, when we look at it from a perspective like this one. So, so hopefully that was uh, helpful. Uh, this is what we had for you today. Um, we are going to uh, follow up. The plan is to follow up this, uh, this webinar with a series of webinars where we'll dive into each of those heuristics much more uh, specifically uh, and really like, present the overall process of uh, heuristic evaluation um, for designs using those heuristics. So, so hopefully we'll see you in, in those, uh, those upcoming webinars in the next couple of months. And I will turn it back to Laura for questions. Thanks, Denis. So we have a lot of really great questions here. So I'll try to just touch on um, some big ones. Um, one that came up was, would a <coughs> pop-up chat box be considered an element that moves, flashes, or animates? And what is your opinion on using a pop-up chat box on a university web page? Huh. Well, I, I, I would always be 
cautious about using a pop-up to begin with, especially if that pop-up is going to be populated with a lot of information. Um, so to begin with, I, I would probably argue that it's probably safer to have that chatbot not being in a modal, but rather, or a pop-up, but rather being in a, a full page. That's less, that's less manipulation to do as a user to begin with. If the pop-up is, is properly built, however, and the, the focus is really sent to it and it remains within it as long as you don't actively decide to dismiss it, then it's not as big of a deal. Um, for, for that, so that's for that part, I would say. In terms of accessibility of the, 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 the conduit itself, the modal, it can be made much less of a problem if it's built accessibly in the first place. Now, the, the, chat, the, the chat functionality within creates another issue um, as long as, uh, again, focus is not properly maintained. If focus is properly maintained, then you can easily see the conversation as it unfolds. And, uh, and, and it moves within the screen and what you're seeing is really what is currently active as opposed to just like being sent back to the top or, or it doesn't really, um, the, the page doesn't really scroll and you always have to figure out a way to go back and scroll to the bottom to see the, ne the next response, the following response. And obviously that just confirms that the idea of a model to begin with is probably not the best approach to it. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, it, it's ultimately, I don't, I don't feel that the design decision per se to make it inside a modal is to be, is completely bad. I don't think that it's the best approach, but it really depends on how it's implemented, I would say. Great, thanks. So we have another one here. Um, could you please share your thoughts about all cap text, uh, which is hard to read for most, especially with those with dyslexia, and your thoughts on field labels within the field itself? Okay, so um, so all caps text to begin with. Um, there are some there is some research out there that does confirm that reading text in, in all caps is, is harder. I think from, from memory, I think it's like twenty. It, may, it makes it slows you down by like twenty five percent or so, and then letters are a little more difficult to recognize sometimes for some people. So there's probably value. I mean, there is value in in, in keeping that to a minimum. Um, I don't think that there's a big enough impact when you're using all caps on, say, headings or very short um, pieces of text. It becomes a problem, obviously, if you have full, all paragraphs that are like that. Um, but I think that the, the, um, the barrier that it creates on much smaller pieces of content is more ne negligible. Um, if you can avoid it altogether, I would say go for it. But um, there are probably a lot of things that are more important for you to, to focus on than, than, than all caps on, on, say, a heading, for instance, or maybe a, a menu item. But if, you, if you're using all caps on full, full paragraphs of text, for sure, I would, I would, I would advise against, against doing that. Now, for the, uh, the, the text labels inside the, the form controls, we're essentially, essentially talking about placeholder text here. Um, that is one thing that we tend to, to say uh, that people should not use. Uh, three reasons for that, basically. The first one is, well, like I said earlier, the, con the, the content, the, the labels themselves are not persistent. So as soon as you input something, they disappear. So you no longer have them. So that creates an issue for someone who can't remember what those were as they're trying to validate their, their answers before submitting, for instance. The only way that you could submit, you could validate then would be to remove your answer so it comes back and then you would put it back in. So it's a lot of overhead to do that. There's another issue uh, that comes from color contrast where, uh, where, where by default the, the text labels are light gray, usually against a white background, sometimes against a gray background. So they're very difficult to see, to perceive. Um, so for a lot of people, that might also be an issue, whether we're talking about color contrast or low vision or just against sun glare might create, might cause you to miss them altogether. There's another problem with some people, uh, and then sometimes what, what people will do is that they'll, they'll decide to make this, the, the text darker through CSS. So they don't have that color contrast issue, but then you have some people who run into those forms and assume that the, there's already an answer provided, so they don't really pay attention and they just submit without having entered anything into those fields. So uh, just because they don't pay attention or because they want to go through quickly or because maybe it's a, it's a matter of, of having um, 
ADHD, for instance, and, and not paying attention to it or, or, or wanting to be quick, basically. So those are all reasons that come to mind uh, about why we should not use uh, placeholder text. Uh, now, of course, there are ways to use placeholder text and then in an accessible way by making that text float on top of the text field. I mean, when it's done that way, that's fine. But again, it depends on the implementation itself because oftentimes if that implementation is just moving text over and the text is not really connected or associated programmatically with the text fields, then again, it will work visually. You, you fix the issue of not, of not being able to perceive it properly or maintaining it, but you still don't provide, you're still not providing a, a, um, a, a form control that is programmatically associated to the text field for a screen reader. So as long as it's built properly, I figure, why not? But oftentimes what we see is that it is not built in an accessible way, and therefore it creates those issues. Great, thanks, Denny. Um, here's an interesting one. Is there a general rule about what contrast ratio is too high? For example, for someone who is prone to migraines when the contrast um, could be too high? I don't know of an actual ratio. I do know that I've heard a lot of people say that white text on a black background or vice versa, black text on a white background makes it too bright for them and that creates headaches or it makes it very difficult to read content. Um, so, so there's been a movement in, in, well actually a while, a few years already, where designers tend to use softer shades of gray uh, as backgrounds instead of pure white if they have black text or they'll have a darker shade of gray as opposed to black against white text to sort of soften that uh, that uh, that co contrast uh, but I don't know of any particular ratio that would uh, that would do that like I, I, I yeah I, I guess anywhere around 19 to 1 is probably starting to be a little aggressive for some people got it um, here's one that's really interesting do you have any suggestions or resources on fonts that are better or worse and in addition to that, kind of an add-on, can you address the issue of font size for accessibility? Um, the first part of the question is, uh, does it come down to, are there some fonts that are more accessible than others? Is that what, what that is? Cor correct, yep, okay. or any resources. Maybe we could share those after the fact, if you have any. Yeah, I can't think of a resource about this. Um, there's obviously a couple of fonts. Uh, like open dyslexic, for instance, that always come come back in those discussions. I'm I'm kind of dubious about it because I hear a lot of people saying that they, it really doesn't work that well for them. Other people actually say that it does help. Um, so so I think there's a is, there's a matter of preferences also uh, that that gets in in the way. There there's value in in some of those fonts for dyslexia because they have like they they tend to have a like a broader base so they're easier to identify and you don't tend to mix them as much as the entire idea of, of designing the font in the first place so it helps some people some people will tell you that it looks way too much like comic sense and that it doesn't sound or look professional or serious as a result of that so they don't want to use it um, so I, i'm guessing that one of the ways in which you could sort of get the best of both world would be to provide a mechanism for the user to change to a particular font if that's that's easier or if that helps them. Open Dyslexic might be one of those fonts, but I would definitely offer other options as well in terms of, uh, of personalizing uh, the font that, that people might want to prefer. Uh, so that's for that first part, I guess. I, I But I don't know of any resource that I, off the top of my head that, that really analyzes this specifically. Now the other part of the question was about font size per se. Um, again, if you look into, um, into usability research, there's been a common agreement around 12 pixels as, as a comfortable font size for most people, but I hate that idea to begin with because most people is not who I want to meet, who, the, the needs of who I want to meet. I want to meet the need of all people, if I, needs of all people if I can. So, uh, but there's no way to do that with a default font size, obviously. You have to make a choice at some point. And that's why in accessibility, you, don't, you won't find anywhere a particular font size that is defined as the accessible level upon, uh, beyond which you can't go. So, so there's no minimal font size. The idea, what really matters is that you make sure that whatever font size you determine, I'm always going to be able to bypass that to get to a level that is comfortable for me, for my own needs. And that might be 200% bigger, 400% bigger, 800% bigger, if that's what I need. 
as long as I can do that and I'm not breaking your interface as a result of that, and I can still read all the content, none of it gets truncated, none of it gets, uh, it gets broken down or, or overlaps to another, another piece of content or I don't lose part of it, then, then again, that's fine. So it's, it's really about defining or designing your interface so it, uh, so it adapts to whatever size that I feel is, is, is good or works for me. That matters much more than the font size itself. Got it. So here's probably the last one that we have time for. Um, what is the best practice for displaying a read-only form value? For example, a radio button or a checkbox. Can you repeat that again? The best way to? The best practice for displaying a read-only form control value, for example, a radio button or a checkbox. Hmm. I don't know if there's a really a best way to do that. By default, having a read-only button or, 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 or interface component per se it means that it's going to be grayed out or inactive to begin with. So the very idea of having that element might create issues for some people. I can ima easily imagine someone perceiving some kind of a button there, but not being able to read the text that's on it because it's disabled. Thinking low vision, thinking color contrast maybe, thinking that kind of, of challenges. Or it might be someone coming in with a different piece of technology that doesn't quite convey that the button that's there cannot be used right now because a particular step has not been covered beforehand that allows that element to become active. So my best practice, I guess, is to not have that control in the first place visible until it can be triggered. Uh, but that's not always possible either. But, but if we have, say, for, say we have a, a form and the submit button is disabled until all conditions are being, have been met in the form, I would argue that it's probably safer in most cases to not have that button at all until the controls are, are all, or the conditions are all met, and then the button becomes available and is visible also. Um, but that's also confusing in a way, so that's not ideal either, um, which thinking about that part makes me want to go back one step more and say that if we had, uh, if we don't disable, again, considering that it may be a form with that button there that's disabled until all the conditions are being met, I mean, it's probably safer and much more usable for everyone to just leave it as is and then have a, again, have a little bit of JavaScript that prevents it from being, from being submitted until the conditions are met. And that's usually just validation of your form. Um, so I guess it depends, again, on, on the context and, and, and the reason why we would want to disable some, some form elements. But um, yeah, th there aren't any ideal way to do this because as soon as we disable something, by default, it is meant to be disabled, to look disabled, I mean, and, and by doing so, it will make it more more hard for some people to understand what to do with it or, or why they can't use it. So a lot of confusions either way, I think, if we rely on doing that. Okay. Well, it looks like we are out of time, but I appreciate everyone for attending. This was probably one of our highest attended webinars that we've had so far. Um, I know we had a lot of questions that we didn't um, get to. We'll try to get those answered via email. And just another reminder that we'll be emailing out the recording, the presentation slides, the handout. And then we also had a lot of really helpful resources that people were sharing in the chat box. So I'll try to compile those in a, in a friendly manner that we can share on the email as well. So thanks again. We look forward to hosting, um, as Denise said, we'll be hosting more installments of this UX webinar series. And we will talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.